City, this is Entertainment Weekly, the show. This week, we're standing up for something with Common and Andrew Day, exploring space with Adrian Palicki, and letting Nick Kroll and John Mulaney shoot their big mouths off. Plus, the latest Entertainment Weekly is all about Aegis Elba. Oh, so get ready to swoon, people, because the show starts now. Welcome to the show. I'm Lolo Ganike, and it's been a very tough week in the news. In the wake of the horrible tragedy in Las Vegas, people turned to late night hosts for comfort and they delivered in a big way. Conan lamented the number of times he's had to address gun violence on his show. Seth Meyers called for serious gun control legislation. And Jimmy Kimmel, who is a native of Las Vegas, fought back tears throughout his nine minute monologue. Take a look. The Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, the Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, a number of other lawmakers who won't do anything about this because the NRA has their balls in a money clip. Tell your Congress people to do something. I mean, it's not enough to send your love and prayers. It seems to be coming uh, increasingly difficult lately. It, it feels like someone has opened a, a window into hell. Kudos to late night hosts for rising to the occasion. Now another sad news, legendary rocker Tom Petty passed away this week. Petty and the Heartbreakers had just wrapped up their 40th anniversary tour, which won rave reviews. And over the course of his illustrious career, Petty's influence in the world of music was extraordinary. And now we can celebrate the fact that Nelson Lefty and Charlie T. Woolbury Jr. are having a rockin' reunion. Everybody got somebody to lean on. Rest in peace, Tom, and thank you for your beautiful work. Okay, so we so needed a silver lining this week, and we got one from the queen herself, Oprah Winfrey. This week, the media mogul retweeted a New York Post article that argued that she should run for president in 2020. Imagine Oprah as president. We'd all have cars, we'd read more books, and we'd be able to eat bread because we'd all be on Weight Watchers. Bread and books. I say yes. Yes, Oprah, we need you. Please run, please, we need you. All right, if Oprah in the Oval Office isn't enough to bring a smile to your face, I know what will. Idris Elba. Yep, Idris is like butter. He makes everything better. <laughs> Idris. So be sure to pick up EW's latest issue with the Wire Star on the cover. He has three films coming out, and I'll be seeing all of them. Yes. That's it for headlines. We'll be right back with more show and more Idris, hopefully. Welcome back to the show. I have two music powerhouses joining me today, Common and Andrew Day. Welcome. Peace. Thank you. This song from Marshall is dope. I saw the film the other night. It is fantastic. And you are just extraordinary. That voice is oh, like you yeah. open your mouth and dubs come out. <laughs> it's great. Why was it important for you both to be a part of this project? First of all, with starting with the movie and just the legacy of Thurgood Marshall and the reason that we have a lot of the liberties and freedoms that we have today and uh, why we're even as a community, as a black community, able to interact with people the way we do a lot of because because of the work he did. And so um, just honoring his legacy was super important to me. Um, actually, through Diane Warren, is who wrote Stand Up for Something. And she's a legend. And who is a songwriting, yes, legend and genius. And um, she told me that Common was actually interested in being a part of it. And both of us at different times, I had had conversations with Diane about working together, and then him and I had conversations about working together. So it just kind of came together really I, serendipitously spiritually whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. but um you know the incentive really was the legacy of thurgood marshall but also the relevance of the film of what he fought for and the message in the song today you know it's unfortunately still relevant yes, art is one of the most powerful um instruments of change i mean I, I look at just my life in itself and see how much art like one of the songs that one that you know, like really sparked me to write and was uh, this song "Happy Birthday" by Stevie Wonder. And little did I know, like that that song was really it was a it was a big 
component to, to getting Dr. King's birthday to be a national holiday. Mm -hmm. He created that song and went around and toured with, um, with Gil Scott Heron, and that was part of that campaign. So, you know, and from Nina Simone to Public Enemy, mm -hmm. um, to, to do the right thing, to, uh, you know, to, Shin, to Shinla's list, it, it always can take you somewhere to teach you about people. Mm -hmm. And um, art is so powerful in that way, and I think, you know, what I, what I feel grateful for with Stand Up For Something is that we've been able to combine the, the, the music and, and the film, is, and Thurgood Marshall himself, he'd already did the work, so we just carrying that torch further. But we also, like, adding a component of activism to it and, like, really not only having the conversations but of figuring ways which we can use this platform to, to charge people up because that's what the song has done for, for us as, as creators and participating in the song. Mm -hmm. So we want people to go out and, you know, do really what a lot of people are doing now is just finding ways they can contribute towards making humanity better. You know, the, the chorus is so simple and yet so powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, you essentially sing, it yeah. all means nothing if you don't stand for something. You can't mm -hmm. just talk that talk, you've got to walk that walk. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like your fellow musicians should be walking that walk more? I think it's a bit of both. It is your choice, but I also think it is your responsibility, you know? So, I mean, we can choose to not be responsible and to not do anything, but you know, yeah, I think as an artist, it is, you know, again, we echo our environment, we echo the landscape, we echo what we see, and um, and we make people aware of it. So I do think we have a responsibility to say something, to do something, to get involved. There has been a stigma attached to being someone who raps about something of substance or, you know, ha tries to use their music to have a social impact. Do you enjoy the fact that that tide seems to be shifting, that people are also, I guess, for lack of a better term, more woke in the music industry? Well, I think when I initially started getting labeled as a conscious rapper, I, I wanted to shake it off me because I, at the same token, like drinking and I liked, you know, like enjoying myself. And, you know, I'm a, a human being like other people, like socializing, like watching basketball, you know, just yeah. so I was like, no, don't, every conversation doesn't have to be serious with me. I like to joke, you know. So When we build together, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, it's like, dude, okay, can, we just, can we just talk a little shit, just have fun? You know, I do think it's great that now a lot of people are being, you know, using the term woke and, and uh, into consciousness, but they still understand you can, you know, you still can have fun. You know, people joke yeah. now. So I, I think it's, it's great that people are aware, and I don't have a problem being call that because I, I've shown other things and aspects about me now. So. Let's talk about you and John Legend winning that Oscar. Take me back to that moment when you heard your name called. I mean, a lot of people in the room had never heard your real name, yeah. so they were like, who? Yeah, I know. I know. It's like, that, was like, <laughs> that moment was, man, it first gave me a chill because Lonnie Lynn is my father's name too. And my father had just passed in September, so I felt like, Man, he was just like looking down upon me, like, "Yo, this is it. This is son. You're doing great." So that that moved me in a way. And then, you know, had to have my mother there and what we, like I said, what we were representing, Selma, and like the people of the civil rights movement. And then, like, so you won the song was Glory. Glory, from we Ava won with Glory. Yeah, Selma. and just to be representing Ava like that experience I had on that film, it it, it changed my life. So to win for that, and when they called our name, and then. Oprah, it was a moment where I, people say I, I, didn't, I like went past Oprah and didn't give her any dap. Like I, I played out, I did like this. I, I didn't do that to Oprah just so I could clear my name. But it was just because I thought she was looking at John and I was looking at somebody else. Anyway, I had to explain that because I had to get that out. Mama would never do that to you, Oprah. To Oprah. <laughs> Not to you, Oprah. So um, what advice have you given the lovely Andra about acting? Because you've successfully made the transition from being a performing artist in the studio to being on stage. And That's I hear that you enough. have aspirations as well. I, I want to get into film. I want to get into acting. I'm, I've always been passionate about it. I've always loved it. But I'd like to take time away from music for a second to really dive into because this is a craft this is what some people build their entire lives on you know they they go to school for this they train for this so I don't want to just jump in for the sake of jumping which is cool you know but 
Um, I do want to take time to like train and work with a coach and you know do all this stuff. And I he's thought encouraging. I, I thought I was your coach. You're my coach. Well, now I have a coach. I didn't find my coach. Now I have an acting coach. coach. So, school or coach? Okay. No, what well, advice I mean, would you give? Her? I mean, what, uh, we, it's funny. We just had this talk yesterday, mm -hmm. and I think you know one of the most important things she already has. She knows it. It's a craft. You wanna you wanna study the craft. Taking time off of music is what I had to do initially. I mean, I've been studying acting, but when I got my first film job, I was like, I can't write a song. I, I had to just focus on that. Um, and, and you know, just the freedom, we talked about this too, is like a freedom and in, in you break walls down when you, you know, when you try, you know, when you go for acting and, and go as an actor to become these characters, you kind of let go of a lot of things that you have as a person and just become this character. Mm -hmm. But can you give him a little bit of your, your English accent <laughs> real quick? Nice Go to ahead. meet you, Pleasure. My name's Andrea, Pleasure. <laughs> oh, she got that, right? That's awesome. Yeah. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> she got that. I can't do that one, so. <laughs> What's your British accent sound like? Terrible. <laughs> it sounds Jamaican. Good I'm and just terrible. Kidding. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah. Good yeah. and terrible. <laughs> you said my British accent it's not Canadian. sounded Canadian. <laughs> Same night. Oh. <laughs> bye, bye. That's Australian, bye. but your Australian accent is on point. All right. I'll cover that right now. If I can find the right continent first. Mate, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Okay, you're okay, welcome. Okay. You are fantastic. You are bloody thank amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Marshall's out in theaters October 13th in stand-up. You can download it right now. Welcome back. I'm here with the actress who plays Commander Kelly Grayson in the new show, The Orville, Adrian Paliki. Welcome. Thank you, Lola. How are you doing? I'm great. Yay! How are you? Now, I can't wait to watch your show, but first, I was wondering if you could fill me in on who's who in The Orville's crew. I sure can. All right. I'm going to get you up to warp speed on who does what on our ship in a segment called Take It to the Bridge. Yes, Take It to the Bridge. Take it to the Bridge. Okay, Captain Ed Mercer. That uh, character is played by Seth MacFarlane, mm -hmm. who's a kind of down on his luck captain who finally gets his own ship. He's a little bit of that, you know, everyman hero. Okay. Yes. All right, Commander Kelly Grayson. Commander Kelly Grayson, played by myself, Adrienne yes. Palicki, uh, is a, she's second in command and happens to be assigned to the same ship as her ex-husband played by Captain Mercer. That sounds like drama. There's a lot of tumultuous, you know, relationships. A little bit of that Ross and Rachel thing happening. Oh, I like Will that. Well, there, won't they? Uh, again. <laughs> I like that. Okay, Dr. Claire Finn. Dr. Claire Finn, played by Penny Johnson Gerald, who is amazing, and she uh, is kind of our, I like to call her as our, you know, she's the matriarch of the show. She's the one who is always the smartest, most knowledgeable, and, you know, saves us all constantly. I love that. All right, up next, Lieutenant Gordon Malloy. Oh God, Scott Grimes. Um, he is our, <laughs> <laughs> he is our comedic relief of the show. Nice. He's kind of, you know, he's also a down on his luck helmsman. He's the best in the galaxy, but he's also the guy that, you know, draws penises on any, you know, surface that is available. So That's he's awesome. best friends with, um, with Captain Ed Mercer and, and you know, he's keeps us all on our toes. Never know when you're going to need an illustrated penis, right? You know, that's what I say. That's what I... <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Bordas. <laughs> Get me oh out of that last God. sentence, please. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Bordas. <laughs> Played by Peter Macon, who uh, is a phenomenal actor, who's also uh, a Mocklin. He comes from a planet of all male. He's an all male species. Oh, um, that sounds boring. He's one of our drier characters, but he's also, to me, I think one of the funniest characters because he doesn't realize that what he's saying is so hilarious. Oh. All right, Lieutenant Alara Catan. Lieutenant Alara Catan is played by Halston Sage, and she's our security advisor. Ooh. And it's amazing because she, she comes from a, a species of, of very 
very strong people. She happens to be the smallest of us all, but the the strongest. Oh. So it's kind of fun to get to see this little peanut, you know, open up doors with just her, you know, her finger. I love that. Small but mighty. Small but mighty. All right. Okay. And last, Lieutenant John Lamar. Lieutenant John Lamar, played by Jay Lee. Love. Um, he's our navigator. Mm -hmm. And the best part about him is seeing him and Lieutenant uh, Malloy together. They're kind of, to me, the, the Chandler Joey dynamic. I know I, I reference Friends. I do it on a daily basis. Do you like times. that show? I hate it. <laughs> I don't know every episode by heart. <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, they're they're my two favorite together because their their balance of comedy is just I think the best part of the show. I love it. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Can. Go watch a Friends episode while you while you have some time. Why would I? It's all up there. It's all up there. <laughs> Thanks for the info. And The Orville airs Thursdays at 9 on Fox. And speaking of Out of This World Laughs, comedians Nick Kroll and John Mulaney swung by recently to take a walk down memory lane. And their walk took a few hilarious detours. Take a look. Oh, hello. I'm Nick Kroll. Boy, oh boy, have I been in a lot of fun projects over the years. And I'm going to tell you about some of them in a segment called Let the Good Times Kroll. Hi again, I'm John Mulaney. I've been in a lot of fun projects over the years, and I'm going to tell you about some of them right now in a little segment we're calling a Stroll Down Memory Mulaney. We're here together. Should we just do this together? Oh, I'm a little embarrassed that we're here together and you just heard me do that. I know. It was embarrassing to hear you do it. Well, I wouldn't mind joining you. If you don't mind, I would love to join you. But what would we call it? I think we should call it a Stroll Down, down Memory Mulaney. Who could forget I love the 30s? Some people call the 30s the decade of the dictators. The decade of the dictator. The decade of the dictator. They didn't forget it, they never ever saw it. Yeah, it was that was for um, Comedy Central's first web endeavor called Motherload. Motherload. Right. But it was uh, me, John, uh, a bunch of our buddies from uh, college, from Georgetown, who we worked with. This was during the I Love the 80s stuff on VH1, so we did. Oh, yeah. I Love the 30s. It was people in the 1940s talking about. The I forgot 30s. that that was the gambit. But we talked about like the Hindenburg disaster, the Lindbergh, Lindbergh baby, baby kidnapping. kidnapping. It was our first foray into talking about the things that youth culture couldn't give a f about. Yes. This was around the time I had a meeting at MTV and they asked me what music I've been listening to and I said Steely Dan and <laughs> the meeting wrapped up shortly thereafter. Yeah. Let's see, the first season of Caveman. <laughs> <laughs> Yabba dabba do. Seriously, don't, don't do that. It was my first real acting job. It was uh, four hours of makeup every morning. Did I see you while I was in production on that? I saw you for press. I met you at your hotel. Yes. He was at the Parker Meridian and he had to do The View. And John came and wrote jokes with me to do The View in character. And I went in and was dressed as a caveman and got interviewed by Whoopi Goldberg and Joy Behar and... Uh, and Whoopi Goldberg recognized you, Nick Kroll, under your makeup. And I thought, new, I thought we were in trouble. She went like, I know you. And then the show came out, and it was, I'd say, one of the more universally reviled shows on television. Until... <laughs> you hope it was a miracle. <laughs> but probably not. Couldn't have been more well-intentioned, but a train wreck yeah, indeed. I would argue about Caveman, but more importantly about Mulaney, that um, things get chosen to be the thing that people don't like, and your show just got chosen to be the thing that people don't like. I do not disagree with any critic who says they don't like something. But when everyone says they don't like something at once, yes. I sometimes wonder, yes. perhaps there is some group thing going on. Right, but let's talk Stefan. Now, come on. You co-created the character Stefan. <laughs> yeah, Bill Hader and I wrote that character at Saturday Night Live. New York's hottest club is Slash. No. <laughs> this place has everything. Glass, steam, bear traps, and just when you think the fun is over, knock, knock, who's there? It's Black George Washington. <laughs> and what are some of the great hot spots? Oh my see? God, what's my list? Yeah. That's funny, we'll be back in a minute with all that. <laughs> <laughs> Kroll Show. Three seasons, Comedy Central. Yeah, great seasons. I got bangs up. Uh, John Daly, Jenny Slate, uh, Chelsea Peretti, Jason Manzoukas. Uh, all very funny people. Do you like being the boss? I found nothing more exhausting than doing a sketch show. But uh, I love doing it. I was also very happy for it to be over. But you also got to improvise, so 
But was, yeah. it was depleting, it was enervating, it seemed. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you for saying I was tired. <laughs> September of 2016, I think, I called you and I said, let's start rehearsing Oh Hello on Broadway tomorrow. And you said, what's that? And I said, I don't know, we could do an improvisation. And that's, and, and that's how the show is built, improvisation. Well, what we do is it's mayonnaise and tuna fish and we prepare it and then we put it under the lights at 5 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most fun thing I think I've ever done. Yeah, Oh Hello, off Broadway, the tour, and then Broadway, and then the special Oh Hello on Broadway is the most satisfying, fun thing I've ever done. Yeah, big mouth. Premiering September 29th? Yes, John. It's the Hormone Monster. <laughs> no, 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 you gotta be kidding me. Nick is right there, sir. And? And I'm a good person. I wouldn't do that laying next to a friend. Then why am I here? Big Mouth is a show about me, based on me and, and my best friend from childhood, Andrew Goldberg, who I've known since first grade. He ends up becoming a writer and producer for Family Guy. I end up, uh, starring in the hit show Cavemen. Yeah. Uh, and then we came back together to make this show with Mark Levin and Jen Flackett, and we cast you, John yeah, Mulaney. Yeah, to play Andrew, Yeah, the boy. Which is funny, because you're it's another project where you get to sort of play a Jewish person. The, the first. Right, well, because you're not Jewish and oh, hello, but everyone I'm not, but everyone you're. thinks you are, and I also lead people to believe I am. Yeah, because your name is George St. Geegland. Which is not a name or, that's not an anything name. It's not a Jewish name. Certainly not. But you have a Jewish voice. No, I have a, I have a, uh... Are you listening to your own voice now as you Yeah, I went, this? no, I have a, <laughs> I have a voice. Oh my God. It's okay. Anyway. You can stream Big Mouth right now on Netflix. I'm John Mulaney. And I'm Nick Kroll. And this has been a Kroll down Mulaney's Lane. For information on bowling, go to, go to a bowling alley. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm here with the creators of the hit Showtime comedy episodes, David Crane and Jeffrey Cleric. Welcome to the show. And thank, thank you. And thank you for being in our episode. Oh, I like that. So let's talk about episodes. This show's about a comedy couple yeah. writing a sitcom. It's very meta. <laughs> um, and you both are actually writing partners and real life partners. So how much of this show is influenced or shaped by your real life experiences? It's pretty much us. It is us. He's Sean. Oh. Yeah. And of course, I'm the woman. Because <laughs> that's how it works. I'm Beverly. You're yeah. Beverly. And when, yeah. even when we pitched the show, we, we told them, I, because my worldview is like, I, I'm very positive and I'm upbeat and. Um, it's and very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> how does that work? So well, you're glass half full. I'm always. glass half full. And I'm the glass is an idiot. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. <laughs> I hate the glass. You hate the glass. And that's us. And so we thought, well, let's at least profit from it rather than just make each other crazy. Let's do a show. And so uh, Jeffrey, for very little money, Jeffrey it turns pitched. out, because <laughs> it's a BBC and they have no money. Really? Right. Yeah. And even with Showtime involved, it's still. And that's that's how we ended up shooting the whole show in London because it's so much less money to shoot there. So what was it like for you to work on a show with such a shoestring budget? It was a terrific challenge. Uh -huh. it, it, in fact, our agent said, stop saying how little money they gave you because people are gonna think they can just give you little money from now on. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's true, it, it, it really got us yeah, it, thinking. You, you, and you have to like, uh, we shoot the show, we don't do episode to episode, we shoot it because it saves money, we shoot it like a big movie. We shoot at we shoot the whole season. Um, we're like we'll take four days and shoot all the scenes for the whole season in Sean and Beverly's house, and then all the scenes. So they change costumes each scene. That's... So you could be shooting from the very last episode. We shot 
the very last episode, the second week of our show, of our filming. Yeah, yeah and, and then we all, we sit in the editing room for three months. Yeah. And, and, and like try to piece it together Jerry like says. a ransom note. <laughs> the show is in its final season, and the final episode airs Sunday. Sunday. I know. So it's over. 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 It is. Why pull the plug now? I mean, it feels like you had at least two more seasons in the show, I thought. I, this is us again. I mean, David will stay at a party until <laughs> we're doing dishes in the kitchen. Right. My feeling is go when people really are having a good time. So when you leave, they go, oh, right. the party's not as good now that they left. Oh. So that's okay. pretty much how we... That is it. Yeah, I mean, Showtime would have done more, but we said, you know what, let's... We've told a story, I mean, we could have done more, but we've told the story we wanted to tell, and let us put a bow on it and leave uh, with Before people we have wanting to do the more. dishes. Exactly. Now, I would imagine writing a finale is just as difficult, if not more difficult, than writing the pilot. Am I wrong about that? Yeah, it was really hard. We did a lot of drafts uh, because, yeah, how, how do you end a series and you want to do it right? right. And our show, we felt like we wanted to, we've, we've put our lives into this so we want to get it right. Now is it true you were coming off of heartbreak from a failed CBS show and you decided <laughs> that you'd never wanted to do television exactly, again? Exactly, exactly right. And then a friend came along and said, give it one more try. Yeah, he had just done a BBC show mm -hmm. and he said, it's what you, with, you always wanted television to be. Mm -hmm. They give you the money, they say go do it and you never see them again. And nobody cares whether they get the numbers. They're, nobody's watching like hawks. And so I said, well, if we could go to England and do it with the BBC and only have to do six or seven episodes and write them all ourselves. And, and so that was how it started. And then we thought of an idea <laughs> which would mean we could shoot it in, the, in L.A., which would be taking a British couple, which would appeal to the British people, and having them come here to do their show. Right. Turns out, because we had no money, we couldn't afford to shoot it here. So, so the irony, that was the couple. idea. We thought, oh, we'll get to stay home. No, yeah. now we have to go there, try to create LA. Yeah. It's so meta, it's got so many levels, it's ridiculous. It's so meta, yeah. it's meta. I didn't know what meta meant until we did the show. How do you all divvy up labor? Because I understand that you write all of the episodes. You have no writer's room, no. it's just the two of you. Yep. Uh, it's just the two of us at home talking and talking and talking till uh, I've annoyed him and then we stop well, for a while. Because it feels like we have no other life. <laughs> so we'll, well be do in... you have another life? No, that's why it probably feels that way. <laughs> we, we, we talk about it day yeah, and night. We're in the car, we're, we're in the kitchen, we're, and just keep talking about it. Until I, I just say, can we not? talk about it for five minutes. That's all I'm asking. Let's just talk about anything else. Mm -hmm. And then we have nothing to say. There's like a pause. You want to watch, listen to Howard Stern? <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, we don't. Yeah. And then there's quiet. And then uh, usually I think of an idea and I say, what about if Beverly, you know, and yeah, then and we're the, back. The guy who said we're not allowed to talk about it starts talking about it. So, yeah. I don't believe that this show is over. Hmm. Nothing ever dies in television. Well, it does now. feel that way lately. Over. Oh my God! Will and Grace is back. I know. Will Matt Roseanne. About you. Roseanne's back. I heard. I heard Matt about you. They're talking about maybe bringing. I mean, back. what isn't coming back? Well, is Friends coming back? No. It's not? <laughs> that is what is not coming back. That is what is no, not coming no, back. Are you exactly. sure about yes, that? Yes, absolutely. No, no. Positive. Yes. It, well, if we have anything to do with it, it's, it, we Why? did it. Because we did it, and it's done, and we did it right, and it's not like, oh, I, I want to see Friends. Well, it's, thank, uh, there's no wood to knock on here. But, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you want to see the show? You get to see the best version of it. You can't go back. You know, you, you sit there and go, oh my God, what happened to yeah. him? How did they get so old? Yeah. And they're not, they're, they're not so funny anymore. I heard that a production company reached out to you about possibly making the fake game show yes, that the Matt box. LeBlanc yeah. hosts, yeah. The Box, yeah. into a real show. Yep. The, the well, people who, who created uh, Dancing with the Stars right. want to do the box as a show. In the UK. In the UK, and then syndicated that all over the place. It's and, crazy. Yeah, and I said to Jeffrey, you know if we did it in real life, someone would die in one of those boxes. <laughs>
And they said, but we want to make it darker. I'm thinking, darker? It's, <laughs> it's, you're stuck in a plastic box for 17 weeks. That's not dark enough it gets dark without enough. a toilet. And on that note, okay. gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Aww, <laughs> thank you. The finale of episodes airs Sunday at 10 on Showtime. Tune in. Welcome back. Ksenia Solo from the film In Search of Fellini dropped by recently to give us a tutorial on foreign travel. And this jet setter was one first class guest. Take a look. Hi, I'm Ksenia Solo. So in In Search of Fellini, I play a girl named Lucy and she gets stuck in Verona on her way to Rome. Um, but it kind of turns out to be a good thing because she gets swept up in a little romance. So I'm gonna give you a few travel tips. Okay, so before you go to Italy, you wanna make sure you have an empty stomach that is ready for a lot of amazing food, an amazing gelato, and you wanna have comfortable shoes because you're gonna do a lot of walking. I would say my biggest advice to deal with jet lag is to drink a lot of water, and when you land, if you land in the morning, try to walk all day, don't go to sleep right away, and then maybe um, you'll have better luck at falling asleep at a decent hour. I would say if you're going to Italy, it's very hard to pick where to go because everywhere is beautiful. But I think Rome is a really important city to see. It really is the, the lifeblood of the country. And I think Rome is like the New York of Italy. And New York is obviously the greatest city in the world, so I think Rome is a must-see. Trust me, if there's any way that you can wake up right before the sun is rising and go see the Trevi Fountain or the Colosseum or whatever it is that's on your list. And I just think there's a sense of magic and romance in the air. You kind of can't avoid it. So, some Italy rules. Don't expect good customer service. Waiters don't work for tips. I think that's one of the most shocking things um, for Westerners. Um, to discover when they get there because here we're used to a certain standard in restaurants and um, there things are a little different. So just be prepared. The other thing I would say is do not have a cappuccino in the afternoon. Cappuccinos are meant for breakfast. To find out more about traveling in style, see In Search of Fellini in theaters now. Thanks, Ksenia. That's our show. Thanks to all my guests. And don't forget to grab the Aegis Elba issue of Entertainment Weekly on newsstands now and at EW.com. Bye.